Amen. Good morning. Uh, well, I'm excited to preach God's word for you this morning. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Tripp. I'm the young adult pastor here, and I'm excited for this chance. I want to say thank you to Pastor Carter, though he's not with us, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and, and we're going to continue. Anybody been enjoying the Hot Topic series that Pastor Carter's been going through? Yeah. Well, we're continuing in that today, and today we're talking about dealing with difficult people. Um, Somebody said God got a word for him this morning. Uh, Romans 12, we're going to be looking at verse 17. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Some people pulling out paper who never took notes before right now. This is what God's word says. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's God's word. You can go ahead and take your seats. So like I said, this morning we're talking about dealing with difficult people. Uh, and, and the passage we just read, uh, it shapes this conversation in a way we're not usually used to thinking about it. It, it makes it bigger than just our own personal issues. There's something bigger at stake for us. And, and I'll give you an example so you understand what I mean. Um, professional athletes, uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, that they're allowed to do, that they get to enjoy. Uh, but professional athletes, um, the, when the leagues get really tough on them is when they do something that's considered cheating. Uh, so they can't take steroids. They can't try to get these unfair advantages over their opponents. Uh, but another form of cheating that uh, these, these leagues don't allow is players gambling on games that they're playing in. Um, because uh, the, the reason you don't want players to do that is because uh, there could be a situation where a player um, could be in a situation to help his team win, but instead he decides to lose because he can make some money off of that. Uh, where, you know, it would be good to win this game with his team, but that he has this whole other game going on the side, that it's a conflict of interest. Uh, there was this uh, baseball player, Pete Rose, who, who gambled on the game, and he got caught, and he was banned from baseball forever. And the reason it's such a big deal is because it doesn't only affect that player, if you were to have the chance to be able to choose to win, which is unimaginable, to have the chance to be able to choose to win but to decide to lose because you were trying to win at something else altogether. And it's something that affects not only that player, it also affects the team. Uh, you know, it also has something to do with how the team is seen. Uh, it, it also affects the fans who are paying all this money to see their team try to win. It, it's crazy to have the chance to win, but to choose to lose because you're playing another game. Well, there's, some, there's something like that going on in our lives that Paul talks about in this passage. He talks about uh, this, this fight, this battle that's going on in our lives, in situations between good and evil. And what he says is that we actually have the choice not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. And we can choose to do that. But there are some times when we could choose to win but we choose to lose instead because there's a whole other game that we're trying to play. And it's not just something that affects us. The stakes are high. The stakes are even higher than we're talking about professional athletes uh, because it doesn't just affect you. It affects other people. It reflects poorly on the people that Jesus calls his own, and it looks bad. Uh, it makes Jesus look bad too. Paul was going to say that there are bigger things at stake here in this fight between good and and evil, and he says that we can overcome evil with good. So, you know, we're not surprised that, that, that talking about difficult people is something uh, that was one of the main topics, 
right? One of the main things that people said they wanted to hear about um, because it's something that all of us have to deal with. All of us have to deal with difficult people, right? We, we deal with them at work. Uh, you know, we deal with them when we get home from work. Uh, some of y'all are thinking, I'm sitting next to a difficult person right now. Blink if I'm right. Just blink twice if I'm right. I won't tell you. I just want to know who to pray for. Uh, dealing with difficult people is something that all of us will have to do, and it's one of the hardest things that we we'll actually have to deal with in our lives uh, because it can poison anything. I mean, if, if I was to ask this whole room, hey, tell me what are some areas of your life that you wish looked a little bit different, and you began to name those areas, and then I asked what would have to change for that to get better, we would probably start to name some difficult people who are making those situations harder. I, you know, I may ask you, how do you feel about your work life right now? And a lot of people might say, well, it's not as good as I want it to be. And if I ask why, you would name a coworker who's driving you crazy. Or you would name a boss who, who doesn't, it seems like no matter what you do, it's never enough. Or if I asked how your home life is right now, if you said it was tough, you would probably talk about relationship with your kids or with your parents or with your spouse. And I could go on and on. In every area of our lives, dealing with difficult people can really ruin everything. It can make everything go downhill. But it's something we all got to deal with, right? The hardest thing about it is trying to figure out how we're supposed to respond when we're dealing with difficult people. Because the very natural response is that we, we want to be difficult too. I saw a dude on Instagram had a shirt that said, I'm saved, but you can still catch these hands. Uh, and I, I was looking for that in, in Romans, but I didn't see it. I thought, I got some extra passages that I don't have. But we're tempted to respond by doing evil back to people when evil comes our way. And when that happens, we often feel helpless. Like, they brought this situation to me, and now I'm in this situation. But Paul is going to say, we're not helpless. We can actually overcome evil with good. That's my main point. If you walk away with one thing in terms of how to deal with difficult people, is this, overcome evil with good. Now, in what we're looking at, the, uh, the 12th chapter of, uh, of Romans, um, Paul does what he does in, in all of his letters. He'll, he'll spend the... Uh, the front portion just telling us big truth about God and what God has done for us. And then he makes this shift where he begins to tell us how we're supposed to live in light of that. And he does that in Romans 12. And he starts by telling them how Christians are to live with one another. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to mourn with one another, rejoice with one another. And then verse 17, he makes this shift and he starts to talk about how we're supposed to live in the wider world that's, that's hostile often to us, and it has to do with more than our family inside. And so I, 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 we want to point out in these verses uh, three things uh, that will help us to overcome evil with good. Number one is this, pursue peace. Number one, seek peace. I'm going to read verse 17 again. He says, do not repay evil for evil. Right away, Paul knows what our temptation is going to be. To repay evil for evil. It's the first thing that pops up in our head. As soon as somebody does something crazy to us, we immediately start plotting how to get yeah, I'm gonna get them back. Some of y'all, it, it scares me how creative <laughs> and how quick you are with these schemes and plots. Like, have you been secretly planning this just in case? Um, we immediately do that. Even if somebody just like texts you, don't text you back for a couple hours. And then they finally text you back. You're like, yeah, I ain't going to text you back now. You took a long time. I'm going to take a long time. Even if you're sitting there looking at your phone waiting on it, you're like, you still ain't going to text you back now. <laughs> Set a timer to make sure you don't text them back too quick. We are quick to want to repay people for whatever has come our way. And why is that? Very deep theological answer, because we petty. Because we are petty people. On a bigger picture, uh, it's that we, we all have this thing in us, this sense of, of competition that rises up in us really easily. And what we do is we treat all these little conflicts as little competitions that we're trying to win, and we don't want somebody to one-up us, right? We don't want somebody to be able to get more points on the board than we do. You, you've hurt me, well, I'm going to hurt you back. And we treat it like this kind of give-and-take, back-and-forth competition, and let me tell you this, competition is fine when you're playing a game where the goal is just you winning. 
right? It's good if you're playing uh, pickup basketball competition, it's good. Are you playing board game? Are you playing spades? Now, it can go wrong, I admit, but competition <laughs> is good in no senses. But when we begin to get into the realm of relationships, competition is not good. Competition poisons everything. Uh, this kind of always trying to figure out how to have the upper hand and make sure you're winning, that, that, that mindset can ruin anything about a relationship. But all of us have this little competition thing in us from when we're younger. And, you know, I see it with my kids uh, where they can turn anything into a competition. It don't matter what it is. You're eating dinner, whoever can eat first real fast, go upstairs, get ready, whoever can go upstairs real quick, real fast. It's like, you know, anything. I mean, like anything. Y'all pray for me. Anything can be a competition. But it's not just kids, it's in us too. Um, you ever been driving and uh, somebody behind you, all of a sudden they get over into the other lane and they trying to pass you? And it's just something in your soul that's like, oh, you just gonna pass me, that's what we doing? And you was doing just fine at that speed, but, but now you, you start to like try to real sneakily, you know, speed up just a little bit while they're on the side of you to make sure they can't get past that other car. And then you feel like you did something, like you just try to pass me again, bet you won't. For no reason at all. You heard driving like a NASCAR driver. For this person you never gonna see in your life again. Did you scare they gonna think you slow? I don't know. But it's because we have this sense of competition as we're always trying to compare ourselves to others and figure out where we land. And when we bring that to relationships, it's toxic, especially when we bring it to conflict. It poisons everything. Because how can you be committed to the good of other people if your main goal is defeating other people? That's literally the opposite of loving others. It's trying to make sure you come out on top because you're just self Interested, And so Paul says, don't repay anyone evil for evil. And that word repay is a good word because what we're doing is we're doing this give and take this trade-off. Okay, you're going to give me that? Well, I'm going to give you this. And Paul is saying, do not do that. It turns into this weird transaction where we're both just harming each other and nobody wins. You know, what, what, what does that look like? What are some examples of repaying evil for evil? You know, your, your coworker, you hear that uh, your coworker says something crazy to you. They're talking crazy to you. And you say, well, I'm about to talk crazy back. You ain't just going to talk to me like that. Or, or you hear somebody's gossiping about you. And you're like, oh, well, let me tell you what they did. Repaying evil for evil. You know, your friend got a little attitude with you one day. You're like, well, I'm about to get this attitude. You know, it just, we, we just say, okay, what you did to me, I'm going to do back to you. And we just go back and forth. And that's what he's telling us not to do. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, what that looks like in the next point. But here's what he does next. He's going to add to that command with one of the reasons why we shouldn't repay evil for evil. Here's what he says. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, what does Paul mean by that? Because that sounds like an impossible command. Doesn't it sound impossible? Because you can't please everybody. Just ask somebody who's in charge of the radio on a road trip. Right? You can't please everybody. Somebody's going to be mad no matter what. So what is it that Paul's trying to get us to do? Um, you know, so just, this is uh, a hypothetical scenario. Let's say um, you got a coworker who there's conflict with at work. Um, before you figure out how to respond, should you go take a poll of all your coworkers to see what everyone thinks you should do so you can make sure you do what would please everybody? Well, no, I mean, that's, 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 that's exhausting, and that's not helpful, and everyone's not going to agree, right? We, we can even, if, if we're just trying to always come out looking good in everybody's eyes, we can even end up doing things that are sinful because we just don't want people to think poorly of us. So that's not what he's talking about. When he says, uh, do what, is, um, what would be pleasing to everyone, he's saying, I want you to live in a way where people don't have a bunch of mess in your life to be able to point to. Because like I said, the stakes are bigger than just the conflict between you and a difficult person. It's also about um, what it looks like for us to reflect Jesus. So, so it reminds me of what, what Peter says in 1 Peter 2 where he says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So the way he talks about it is like, um, for the Christian, your growth and you dealing with situations in a godly way has to do with more than just you and your self-improvement. It has to do with the souls of other people and the glory of the God of the universe. 
what he's saying is people are going to not like that you're a Christian sometime, and, and they're going to want to find bad things about you, so don't give them things to find. Um, and he's saying you want them instead to be like, man, there's something unique going on here, and I want to know what that is. So some of us got some questions to ask ourselves then about the way that we live our lives uh, in our neighborhoods and in our schools and, and in our jobs? Do we live in a way that says good things about God or things that make people say, I'm good, I'll pass on him? He said we want to live in a way um, that, that, that is right in the eyes of everyone. We should be above reproach. One of the ways we can know, though, because this can slip into people pleasing, and some of us are people pleasers by nature. We just want to do whatever is going to make other people feel, feel good about where we are. One of the ways we can tr- make sure this isn't turned into that is just to check our motives, right? To ask ourselves, now, why am I doing this? Am I doing this just because I want people to like me, or am I doing this to actually try to love them and to honor God, right? It's good to ask ourselves those questions because we can do the right things with the wrong motivations, and that'll help us to, to, to think through that. Checking our motives. Here's what he says next in verse 18. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, one of the reasons this verse is so good to me is because uh, Paul understands what all of us do, that there is no way for us to have great relationships with everybody we know. There's just no way that, you, that you're just going to have these amazing relationships with everybody. It, it made my life easier one day when I realized that there, there was a particular person who I kept having conflict with. And, and I was just, I kept trying to do everything, lay out the red carpet, find ways to love them and serve them. And they were still mad. And, and it, it freed me up when I realized, you know what, the way that they feel and act towards me has absolutely nothing to do with me. I can't assume that. And so I, I can't live my entire life uh, jumping through hoops trying to make them like me. But you want to know what that doesn't mean? That doesn't mean that we get to just, whenever there's conflict, be like, well, it's on them. I'm good. Because some of y'all, as soon as I read that, you was like, good. (laughs) Right? Because um, the peace that Paul is talking about, living in peace with people, it's not a, a, a... a passive peace where we don't have to try. This peace is an active peace that we're seeking. So, so when he talks about peace, he doesn't just mean that when y'all walk past each other, y'all don't box. That's not what he means by peace. Y'all just don't cuss each other out. Um, he means when he's talking about peace that, that there's no barrier that's up in between you, right? That, that there's no significant issue. There's no conflict that needs to be resolved, uh, there being something between you. And Paul is telling us not, not just Uh, to sit back and wait for peace to come, he's saying we should actively pursue it. Because while he says, you you know, you can't control them, he does say as much as it depends on you, meaning it does depend on us at least a little bit. Because sometimes we can just say, if they're good, I'm good. And you know neither one of y'all are good. Or, Or sometimes somebody says they're good and you know they're not. It's like, I know he said he was good, but it seemed like he tried to trip me when I walked by his desk. It's like, you know something is going on. And, and we convince ourselves that we're good, even though you know this, you may have done something to offend them that you need to apologize for, right? Or there may be something they've misunderstood, but, but we should be seeking that peace, going after that peace. When, when we think about the example that Jesus set for us, did Jesus just sit around and wait for peace to be made? Well, no, Jesus initiated and he came after us and he made peace by the blood of his cross. And he's called us to do the same, to go after people and work towards peace actively. And so, so here's some homework for you. I want you to think of somebody in your life who you need to seek peace with. And I want you to think... <laughs> and I want you to think of what steps you can take this week to work towards that peace. Sometimes it's a long road. But what steps you can take to work towards that peace with somebody? And I, and I mean this for I really want you to think of somebody because this is part of what, what the Lord is calling us to do, to live at peace with those around, even those people who are difficult. And, and he does say as far as it depends on you. He, he gives two qualifiers. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, right? So uh, you cannot control other people. 
You can only do what God has called you to do and pray that, that they would do what they need to do and work on them. But you can only do what God has called you to do. Let, let, last thing I'll say here on, on this first point of, of seeking peace is this. Don't be somebody else's difficult person. Because sometimes when we begin to think about dealing with difficult people, you're like, Psh, him, her, them. And somebody else think about you. <laughs> and there are ways that in the same way there are areas of your life that are made more difficult and bitter because of difficult people, there are ways that we may be doing that to other people. And when we're so consumed with ourselves that we can't see what others are doing, we're not even thinking about that way we're making other people's lives harder. And the way that we could be in the, in the way of somebody else's peace. So I want to encourage you also, just ask yourself, am I somebody else's difficult person? Um, th there's also uh, a sense in which we can sometimes blame all of our problems on difficult people. We can assume if this person just wasn't in the mix, everything would be fine, but we refuse to ever look at the things we're doing to make situations more difficult. So while it is real that there's a lot of difficult people that we need to seek peace with that can make our lives harder, um, that, that's not a way for us to just get out of any responsibility for the ways we're making our own lives harder. Right? So, so there's some difficult people stuff we need to deal with in here too. So we're going to overcome evil with good. First thing we need to do is seek peace. Second thing, number two, is avoid revenge. Number two, avoid revenge. Uh, revenge is something that we are all familiar with. We know it well. It's the plot of, of plenty of movies where somebody offends some family member and the whole movie is like, okay, he's going to kill him now or later. It's just what the movie's about. And sometimes revenge can be something that's even glorified, like, okay, something bad happened and justice was taken out. But that's not how Paul talks about revenge and justice. Paul talks about revenge as if it gets in the way of real justice because there's a way it's supposed to happen. Verse 19. Paul says this, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, revenge is when we assess the damage that somebody did to us, and then we think through it and think about how we can inflict that same damage on them. And, and the problem with that is that it's not ours to do. But it's hard not to do it. It's hard not to try to seek revenge because it, it feels like the right thing to do. And here's why. Because it feels like I just can't let them get away with this. Right? When somebody does something to you and you feel like I shouldn't get revenge, but you like, but I, they can't just go on with their life like nothing happened. Right? That, that's part of why it's hard not to do something back because you're like... Either maybe then they'll never know, or it's no consequences. But um, and and we begin to feel like you know I would be kind to them, but that's not what they deserve. That's an injustice. That's unfair. They're not getting what they deserve. And let me tell you how strange that is for a believer in Jesus to be mad that someone's not getting what they deserve. Because as believers in Jesus, our whole life, our eternal life, our joy, our hope, our contentment is all built on us not getting what we deserve in Jesus. It's all built on us having committed horrific crimes against God, but God saying, instead of giving you what you deserve, I'm going to give you grace. But then as soon as somebody else has done something wrong, we turn into activists. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It's like, he just took your sandwich, too. And we feel like, I just can't let this go. I can't stomach somebody not getting what they deserve while we know that Jesus didn't give us what we deserve. But, but, and, but here's, our, here's our problem. We love receiving grace. We do not love giving grace. We love to be on the receiving end of mercy. We do not love to be on the giving end of mercy. One excites us, and one we run away from. But let me tell you what the Bible tells us, that we don't get to choose between the two. 
The Bible says if you have received mercy, you are called to give mercy. If you have received grace, you are called to give grace. If you have received love, you're called to give love. If you've received forgiveness, you're called to give forgiveness. We don't get to choose. This is how the Bible's always arguing. Ephesians 4, when it talks about forgiving, it says, forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. In any other arena, uh, you know, we would call people like that. We would call them stingy or greedy, where you've been given all this grace, but you would refuse to ever share it with anybody else. And that's not how grace and love and forgiveness is supposed to work. God gave it to us in part that we can give it to others. And it's not even just with God. We love receiving grace from other people, but don't like giving Right? We love when someone lets us off the hook for something, and we're so grateful, but we never want to do it for other people. Even, we're even gracious with ourselves. You know, we say we talk to somebody crazy, we're like, but I did have a long week, so. <laughs> but let somebody else do that. He's like, I know he had a long week, but he just should have did better. And, and we just have this thing where we always want to be super harsh on other people and super easy on ourselves. But, but God has called us to be gracious. And part of being gracious is also understanding that sometimes there's a reason that difficult people are difficult people. <laughs> that, that sometimes there's stuff that people have gone through that we just don't know about. We don't know what their childhood was like. We don't know what their week is like. We don't know if their marriage is crumbling. We don't know what's going on in their family. And when we decide that instead of being loving, I'm going to re- uh, repay evil with evil, then what we're doing is we're making something worse for a person in a difficult situation. We don't always know what's going on. So we should be gracious. We should give people the same grace that we want people to give us. And and it's hard to do when we're only considering our own interests. It's hard to see outside of ourselves. Here's the main problem that Paul gives us with us trying to take revenge. The main problem is this. He's basically telling us, hey, you do your job and let God do his. He's saying you play your role and let God play his. Because God is saying I'm the judge. I'm the one who hands out judgment, right? I'm the one who's in charge of this, but what we decide now, if anything, maybe we're the victim of somebody wronged us, but we're not the judge. And what we try to do is we try to tell God, hey, let me help you out with that. I'll do this revenge. But but, but God does not need your help. He doesn't need a co-judge. I made that word up last service, and I'm sticking with it. He doesn't need a cold judge. That's his job, and we should stay in our place. And one of the problems with us trying to do God's job is we're bad judges. We're not good at it. We don't even know what the best judgment is. Anybody who has friends doing pranks knows this. Somebody does something small, and somebody else has burned somebody else's house down. It's like, that was too far. (laughs) Or or there was this story um, uh, a few years back where um, uh, these uh, Auburn fans went and, and hung a, a jersey on a statue at the Alabama campus. And so this Alabama fan was like, oh, you're going to tape something to our statue? Okay. And he thinks about what they treasure the most on their campus, and they have these big oak trees, been around for 100 years. And so he comes up with this plot where he goes every day when the guards aren't watching to poison these trees, and he kills them. And he thinks that this is good judgment for taping a jersey to a statue. And he ends up three years in prison, $800,000 fine. We're not good at deciding what judgment is right. (laughs) We don't even know all the facts. But you know who is good at it? It's God. God is very good at his job. He's good at being the judge. He don't need to collect evidence. He don't need lawyers to lay the case out for him. He sees extremely clearly, and he always judges justly. And, and here's the thing, um, one of the other reasons where we don't, um, we don't need to do this is because it's very gracious of God to say that he will event. I mean, th- think about the fact that our God, the God in the heavens is saying, when people wrong you, don't worry about it, I got it. Like, we think about it like it's taking an L not to take revenge, but, but God is very graciously taking that off our plate. I mean, do we want to spend our life trying to settle every score for every person that's ever wronged us? Think about how exhausting that is, to try to look at every time you've ever been wronged and to make sure you can give the exact perfect punishment for it. That is exhausting. When instead God is saying, look, why don't you give me that? You can go on with your life and love people and be faithful. I'll take care of that. 
That's very gracious of God to do for us. He's saying, I have it. So, so we're not just saying, hey, just be the bigger man, just take that L. We're actually saying God has said he has this in his hands. And, and that means that we can genuinely let stuff go. Not just like, I'm going to be the bigger man, I'm going to push it down. Because usually, I'm going to be the bigger man, I'm going to let it go. Really just means I'm going to push this down until I snap in a few months. <laughs> but we don't have to do that because we can actually say, I'm actually letting this go. Because there are consequences if there need to be, and God will take care of it. But if we would let God be God and us be us, let's be faithful and love people and let God be the judge. Amen? Amen. Um, just, just last thing I'll ask, uh, uh, last thing I want to say before we move on to the last point is this. Not only are we not supposed to do revenge, not only are we not good at bringing out justice, uh, judgment, but when was the last time that revenge ever erased what someone had done to you? What revenge actually does is it just makes the problem way worse. All you're doing is just compounding up a bunch of hurt. It, it doesn't help anything. Um, it, it doesn't actually erase anything, but God, the perfect judge, actually judges in good ways. This is good for students to think about on their way back to school, too. Somebody talks to you crazy, somebody does something to you, you do not have to respond. You do not have to try to take revenge. You don't have to send your little teenage goons after them either. You can trust God to take care of consequences. So if we're going to overcome evil with good, number one, we want to seek peace. Uh, number two, we want to avoid revenge. And finally, number three, we want to do good. Do good. Now, this is what some people want to get off the train. Because like, okay, I understand you're not doing bad things, but we, we're trying to do good things for difficult people. This is, this is what he says in verse, verse 20. He says, on the contrary, contrary to taking revenge, he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. An enemy is somebody... It can be in a lot of forms, but somebody who's just on the opposite side of something that we are, right? So it could be different kinds, different kinds of, of conflicts. And again, you know, we're tempted to just do evil back, but, but Christianity is not some kind of barter system where we just trade, where, um, you know what, I, I'll do good for you if you do something good for me. Uh, the, the way that Jesus has called us to love our neighbor is not based on how they've treated us. That's just not the way that Jesus calls us to think through how we're going to treat somebody. We don't need to see people and run through their track record. Okay, but hold on. Did you, uh, uh, you ain't show up. I asked you to help me move. Uh, nah, that's not how God has helped us to think through this. So, so not only does he say don't repay evil for evil, he's also saying don't repay good for good. Just do good. J just love your neighbor as yourself. Just, just love one another the way that Jesus has loved us. You know, and, and this is hard to do, especially the people who are acting crazy to us to continue to do good to them. It's really difficult to do. I mean, these, this is the thing that, that even made people during the Civil Rights Movement get off the train with what Martin Luther King was thinking. They said, you know what, I, it's too much to say that we need to love our enemies. That's soft. That's not going to do anything. But, of course, what we saw in the end is that he was able to overcome evil with good. Because you can't overcome evil with more evil. All that does is produce more evil. Instead, we should do good to our neighbors. The scripture talks about Jesus telling us not only to love our neighbors, but to make sure we understand he goes far enough to say we're to love our enemies. And, and that's the real kind of competition, uh, the, the real battle we should be thinking about. So instead of thinking, hey, between me and this person, I need to make sure that I come up that's the game that's going to distract us from the real thing. What the Scripture is saying is there's a real sense, and in these situations where we're dealing with difficult people or we're in any conflict where there's this battle between good and evil, which one is going to win out? And he's saying we have the choice to overcome evil with good, not to be overcome by evil. We, we have that choice. And God has given us the power by His Spirit to be able to do that. So instead of getting distracted by the side game of winning, Winning this, 
uh, situation, by, by being able to do more evil, we should be trying to think about overcoming evil with good. And, and, and one of the incredible things about that is that God never calls us to things that he himself hasn't shown perfect. In all areas, when when we see God call us to something, we see that Jesus is the best example of that that there's ever been. So you want to talk about somebody who doesn't repay evil for evil, we can talk about Jesus. If we want to talk about somebody who doesn't go after revenge, we can talk about Jesus. I'm going to read from from 1 Peter 2. This, This is what it says. It says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered... He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So it's saying even Jesus, the Son of God, instead of repaying what people did to him, even though he's going to be the final judge, he still entrusted God to deal with those consequences. But we're saying that we came. Jesus is the greatest example of overcoming evil with good. Jesus is the greatest example of of loving our enemies. When the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God who created the universe, decided to wrap himself in human flesh and be born of a woman that he created, Jesus was loving his enemies. When Jesus decided to walk this earth and to grow like a regular child, even though he's God, he was loving his enemies. When Jesus went around teaching sinners who often didn't want to hear from him and wanted to throw him out of town, Jesus was loving his enemies. When Jesus was putting up with disciples who didn't seem to get who he really was, Jesus was loving his enemies. When the Lord Jesus, even though we had sinned against him, went to the cross on our behalf, Jesus was loving his enemies. When the Lord Jesus got up from the grave three days later, defeating sin, defeating death, defeating the devil, Jesus was loving his enemies. Jesus is the greatest example of this. There's not a single person who Jesus died for who was already his friend when he died. He came after his enemies, and he did it at cost to himself, not us. The Lord Jesus is an incredible example of this for us. And, 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 and it says in this passage that uh, if our enemy's hungry, we should feed him. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus says, hey, I'm the bread of heaven. Whoever comes to me will be forever satisfied. <laughs> the pastor says if the enemy's thirsty, give him something to drink. Jesus says, I'm the living water. Whoever comes to me will never thirst again. So that Jesus is not only promising us forgiveness, he's promising us satisfaction for the rest of our eternity. There is no Jesus like ours, and and that's who we take our cue from. So this week, as you're dealing with difficult people at work or at school or at home, uh, my prayer is is that you wouldn't respond to them the way that they've treated you, but you would treat them the way that you've been treated by Jesus. Let's pray. (laughs) Father. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. God, and we thank you so much for what Jesus has done for us. Thank you for a Savior who came after us when he, we were his enemies, God. And we pray that you would give us grace, Lord, to live in light of that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me?